Controversy erupts after Catholic high school students are accused of taunting a Native American protester in D.C. for what really happened and the reaction to the fallout will be joined by Covington Catholic High School parent and trip chaperone Jim Wilson. And the government shutdown continues, but for how much longer? And what's the status of the president's State of the Union address? White House Director of Strategic Communications Mercedes Schlapp will tell us. And the Vatican continues to deny it knew about sex abuse allegations against an Argentine bishop just weeks before an abuse summit begins in February. And was anti-Catholicism a factor in the Covington incident? Father Gerald Murray is here with analysis. Finally, a World Over tribute to the late Broadway and TV legend Kay Ballard. The World Over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Jim Wilson, Mercedes Schlapp, Father Gerald Murray, and a tribute to the late Kay Ballard are all straight ahead. You can tweet me at Raymond Arroyo. I'll be live tweeting throughout. Here to share what he encountered last week at the March for Life is the parent of a Covington Catholic high school student and one of the chaperones on their trip to D.C., Jim Wilson. Mr. Wilson, thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you for having me. Jim, everyone is now familiar with uh, really what happened with all of the kids at the Covington uh, High School, including Nick Sandman, who really became the central figure here, when he confronted that Native American activist beating a drum, and he, which the, the activist says was an attempt to diffuse tensions between the boy and a very aggressive group known as the Black Hebrew Israelites. Now, here's a bit of the wider video that you might not have seen. A bunch of in incest babies. A bunch of babies made out of incest. Yeah, you's a cracker. You's a cracker. All of you crackers. Jim, you were a chaperone on this trip. What did you see, and why did the boys start chanting? Well, I I arrived um, after some of this had started. Mm -hmm. I had a group of boys with me. Uh, we were heading from the Washington Monument to the Lincoln Memorial. And as you know, there are steps you walk up. We were walking up mm -hmm. the steps, and there were, there were a group of men to the left that I later learned were the black Israelites, and there were a smaller group of men to the right, which I learned to be um, the Native Americans. Mm -hmm. And um, the gentleman with the drum was moving into the crowd of boys. Mm. While I was there, um, waited, um, the, the, the drumming went on, and um, I did hear things like, you're from Europe, go home, this isn't your land. But then the Native Americans came out of the group of boys and the boys exuded no violence on the Native Americans. Mm -hmm. We have video of you here and uh, you're, you're trying to get the kids to move. I'll let people watch that. Why didn't the group move away, Jim? Okay. Did, did you and the other chaperones try to get these boys, you know, away to stand somewhere else? Well, I was able to move them back 15 feet. Um, fr from, the, from where they were from the black Israelites. And I was in between the black Israelites, uh, those men, and the boys, trying to get a few of their attention. I, I just want to convey, the boys had spent 16 hours um, on a bus. They had walked all over Washington, uh, D.C., mm -hmm. and it was 5.30 p.m. Mm -hmm. They hadn't had much sleep. So this whole activity of having grown men yell at them mm -hmm. is kind of like being attracted to a car wreck. You want to look away, but you can't. Yeah. And the one thing I did start doing was saying, hey, this is like a shiny coin, a shiny coin. Mm -hmm. And eight to ten of the boys that were there that saw me and knew me mm -hmm. said, oh, so we're not supposed to be listening to these guys. I'm like, no, we need to get out of here. Mm -hmm. And then they started saying, let's go home, let's go home. And then everybody took off over the hill to where the buses were coming in. Mm -hmm. and, and that was early. The buses hadn't arrived yet, but we right. were out of there. Hmm. So from the time I arrived and the time the Native Americans left, I did get the boys out of there. Mm -hmm. Nathan Phillips, this Native American elder, uh, has said he was not trying to stir up trouble. He told the Today Show that he has forgiveness in his heart, but he actually blames the chaperones. 
that forgiveness even goes to those chaperones and those teachers who should have who should have just said you students this isn't the place if we ever did meet it would be those adults i would like to ask why I didn't have those school administrators there and ask them why didn't they say no what would you like to say to mr phillips uh, jim i have some questions um why did he feel he needed to confront children Mm -hmm. Why didn't he con confront the adults that were screaming the profanities? I mean, it, it's, you know, it, it's not exclusively, let me go after the children and um, uh, do whatever his intent was there. Mm -hmm. They were sitting waiting for a bus. They were doing what they have done year after year. I've done mm -hmm. four of these trips over the last eight years. Mm -hmm. And we show up, uh, we, we have mass. Uh, we, we eat, we sightsee, we do the march, uh, we sightsee, and we show up at the Lincoln Memorial. Mm -hmm. The boys uh, do uh, sightsee around there. They do their cheers on the steps, and we go home. Right. So the boys were doing exactly what they have done for years. Yeah. The new element, the new element were the, were the men that were there that had decided to um, share their point of view, which came across very negative um, to no, the no. boys. They were verbally taunting and abusing these kids. I mean, to my eye, to anybody's eye. And I, I, I did find it yes. strange that you have a grown man trying to diffuse tension by banging a drum in a child's face. If I tried that in Washington, D.C., I promise you, the Capitol Police would drag me away. Um, Phillips also tried to disrupt a mass at the National Basilica. Well, there were parents there. Yeah, I, I want to show people this, though, Jim, first. The, the, he tried to interrupt oh. a mass. Uh, Phillips okay, also sure. tried to interrupt a mass at the National Basilica the day after the march. Security had to lock the doors to protect okay. the people inside. So he may be this uh, avuncular figure I in the media, but he also broke out of jail. Uh, he was not a Vietnam vet, we're learning. He, he was a veteran, but he didn't, he didn't serve in the theater, as he claimed. What's your reaction to all of that and the tension on him? My reaction to him is I don't understand the message he's trying to send. And if he were there, there were parents there. So why go up to a child? Mm -hmm. Why not go up to the parents? Mm -hmm. I mean, I arrived later, but there were other parents there mm -hmm. that he could have went to and talked to instead of um, finding a child to bang a drum in the face. And then his friends that were with him were telling the children to go home. They don't deserve to be here. Go uh -huh. back to Europe. They don't, they don't deserve oh. this land. Hmm. Why, why, how, how, how does attacking a child in a controversial statement calm a situation? Mm -hmm. I think that question needs to be answered. Jim, as a parent, were you surprised that the Diocese of Covington was so quick to condemn the actions of these students? They said before all the evidence was in, quote, this behavior is opposed to the church's teaching on the dignity and respect of the human person. The matter is being investigated, and we will take appropriate action up to and including expulsion. The diocese has now authorized an independent investigation of your children and these other students. Your thoughts? Thank you for that. Um, what, what, what my feeling in is, is on this, since, since I, I know people involved, like I know there's good people at the Covenant Catholic School, I've met Bishop Foyes and I believe him to be a good man. Mm -hmm. it's, it just seems like what happens sometimes in life when there's a crisis there's a lot of dust. Sometimes people don't know if down is up or up is down, mm -hmm. and they're just trying to assess the situation right. in a manner that, that, that they can try to get control over it. I believe Bishop Foyes and the school are going to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So that's how I looked at the statement when it came out. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was kind of shocked by it, I have to tell you personally. And I was thinking, my gosh, if this were my child, because that statement was being used as evidence that these kids had done something wrong, Jim, which I'm sure you felt as you, as you watched this unfold. But, and the other thing that uh, I find stunning, they're, they're authorizing an independent investigation of these school kids on the steps of a, of a monument, but we've got bishops engaged in all kinds of malfeasance, sexually related, and there's no independent investigation of them by the lady. Your thoughts? Well, I think they're investigating the whole scene. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not, no one's came to me and told me it's things that you hear. Mm -hmm. I think they're investigating the whole environment. They're investigating 
all parties involved um, to make sure the bases are covered and I believe to make sure the kids are protected. That is that is currently how I am looking at that. Mm -hmm. Nathan Sandman, the young man at the center of this um, initial video, uh, he went public. Uh, he was asked if he would like to apologize. Uh, here's what he told the Today Show Watch. As far as standing there, I had every right to do so. I don't, I, my position is that I was not disrespectful to Mr. Phillips. I respect him. I'd like to talk to him. I mean, in hindsight, I wish we could have walked away and avoided the whole thing. But I can't say that I'm sorry for listening to him and standing there. What do you make of the way uh, Nick conducted himself during that time with Mr. Uh, Phillips banging the drum in his face? I thought, it, I thought he handled himself. Okay, we have a child being approached by an adult, mm -hmm. banging a drum in his face, yelling in his face, and having the people with him um, yell at them that they needed to go back to Europe and they didn't belong here. Uh, stood there calmly and dealt with the situation. He could have been nervous. He could have been unsure what was going on. But he, he stood there and peaceably waited until the event passed. So I, I think, uh, considering that he's a child, I think he, he handled this, the situation wonderfully. Mm. Some online, Jim, even priests and bishops, the Bishop of Lexington, for instance, have suggested that it was the MAGA hats, those red hats, that were the cause of all the trouble and the boys should not have been allowed to wear them to a pro-life march. Is that a valid criticism? Um, if I may, I, I, I yeah. have some opportunity to think about that letter. Yeah. I actually had an opportunity to read that letter. Uh, mm -hmm. Initially, after I finished reading it, I, just, I got the impression that maybe the bishop may come out with more. It, the letter seemed incomplete and there's some things that need to be expanded upon. One, we're on a march to protect innocent life. Um, do people look at children as innocents? And we had adults attacking children and mm -hmm. children are being held to a higher standard. It, it almost seems like the, um, the phrase, judging a book by its cover, which is what's caused so much controversy and why people are saying, why can't I wear this clothes? I'm being targeted or I'm being screened and people are judging me based on mm -hmm. something I have, I have or I wear. The, the next thing I worry about in, in his statement, which is why I think he, he may want to expand it or he may be thinking to expand it, is you're telling someone who's a victim of a crime that it's their fault. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other aspect is, you know, you, you have kids there, and if the hat was such an issue, um, why weren't the kids, why, weren't, why wasn't guidance given to the kids not to wear the hats? The other aspect is Covington Catholic wasn't the only kids wearing the hats. No, there were kids there all were over Catholic the march wearing kids it. from all across the United States that had the hat. So I, I, the, the letter seems to be directed a little too uh, pointedly at, mm. at, at Covenant Catholic. Um, it's like saying, you know, don't wear the hats. Um, you know, if everyone's going to jump off the bridge, you know, you're going to jump off the bridge too? Well, what if you don't know it's a bridge? I mean, it's mm -hmm. kind of like saying the kids should have known something um, ahead of not knowing it. And I, I, I get it. I, I, I want to understand mm -hmm. that the church is all inclusive. They're there seeking to spread the word of Christ. I get it. And mm -hmm. politics and religion do not mix. Right. Okay, I, I get it. But I think, I think the, the bishop in Lexington, who I've not met, who's probably is a good man too, might just need to expand what he's trying to convey instead of giving the impression that he's saying the boys are at fault. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. I hope that's not the case. No, it, it sounds like he's giving license to the abuse of these boys because of a, a, a piece of apparel they were wearing. And I don't think anyone has a right to approach a child, assault a child, or, or do anything to a child, particularly if you're an adult. That's not your role, no matter what they're wearing. Jim, very quickly, because I'm almost out of time, have you and your families received any threats or the families of the boys uh, that were in your care during this trip? And should those people be prosecuted? Okay, um, the, the 20 or so boys that were with me also arrived late. I'm not aware of them receiving a death threat, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I have not 
um, on social media. I've been called a lot of bad things. But threatening the children, um, the, uh, the county prosecutor in the Kenton County is pursuing, is pursuing mm-hmm. a uh, legal remedy to um, the crimes of death threats to families and children. And I think, mm. I do think it needs to be pursued mm-hmm. so everybody understands they just can't put anything they want to out there causing harm to somebody else. No, you can't attack kids. Jim Wilson, thank you so much for being here and uh, sharing your story with us. Thank you. Mercedes Schlapp is up next, but first some news to share with you. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro is under pressure after the U.S. and other nations recognized opposition leader Juan Guaido as the country's rightful head of state on Wednesday. Trump formally recognized Guaido minutes after the 35-year-old president of the Venezuela National Assembly declared himself the head of state. Countries including Canada, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, and Panama quickly followed the U.S. lead. Maduro responded by breaking diplomatic relations with the U.S., giving American diplomats 72 hours to leave the country. The U.S. has steadily expanded economic sanctions and denunciations of Maduro since Trump took office. Trump told reporters at the White House that all options are on the table for the U.S. to use against the Maduro regime, though he added he isn't currently considering military action. Here to discuss this and much more, I'm joined by White House Director of Strategic Communications and Special Assistant to the President, Mercedes Schlapp. Mercedes, thanks for being with us. Now, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, canceled the President's State of the Union, um, and he responded this way. She canceled it because of the shutdown. Watch. The State of the Union speech has been uh, canceled by Nancy Pelosi because she doesn't want to hear the truth. She doesn't want the American public to hear what's going on. And she's afraid of the truth. And the super left Democrats, the radical Democrats, what's going on in that party is shocking. Mercedes, from the president's tweets, it looks like he's going to wait until the shutdown's over and then we'll have this address. So Tuesday, is it off the map? Is it out of the question? Well, so far, as of today, yes, uh, the president has made the decision to uh, not give the State of the Union on Tuesday. He feels that the House chamber is the right place to be able to address uh, the American people and talk about his great accomplishments that they've be- we've been able to achieve in- under his leadership. And quite frankly, I think Speaker Pelosi has spent more time um, in this pettiness of sending letters about the State of the Union, asking him not to come for security reasons, although that wasn't accurate. Um, and then changing her mind and rescinding the invitation. So she keeps focusing more on that than negotiating and coming to the mm. table, offering a counteroffer, and, uh, and basically reopening the government. Well, former Homeland Security Chief um, and White House Chief of Staff John Kelly, along with four other Homeland Security Secretaries, sent a letter to the President and Congress urging them to end the shutdown, claiming the public safety is at risk. What's been the reaction at the White House and your reaction to that letter? Well, I mean, the the reaction is is that we want the Democrats to come to the table and negotiate. The president presented a good faith offer. Mm -hmm. It it was a a, a proposal that included ways to secure the border, including elements that the Democrats could agree on. And yet the Democrats refused to even uh, have the conversation with the president. Mm. And so they, I mean, Nancy Pelosi put out her statement even before the president spoke on Saturday and said it was a non-starter. So again, we want to be able to reopen the government immediately. At the same time, we need to deal with this crisis on the border. It's a humanitarian crisis. Mm -hmm. It's a security crisis. And too many families in the United States have, has lo- have lost loved ones because of the activities of illegal criminals who have mm. killed family members. And we really should mm. be working on being able to reduce drugs, yeah. reduce crimes, and reduce criminals from coming through the border. Mercedes, the president uh, this evening, uh, it, it seems he's saying he could support a temporary shutdown deal if there's a large down payment on the wall. Is this this three-week continuing resolution thing we're hearing about, that he's willing to open the government for three weeks if they can have an active negotiation? 
He's looking at a number of alternatives, uh, that being one of them. As he mentioned, it would include a down payment for the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, can Congress get their act together? Can the Democrats come to the table and agree to something at this mm -hmm. point where we can have both Democrats and Republicans uh, be able to reopen the government and find a way to ensure that there's border security? The president has made his position very clear. The problem, obviously, has been the Democrats all along, where they have been more focused on politics and less focused on helping federal workers, helping those impacted uh, families that are crossing the border, and also the American people who want and demand safety in their communities. Mercedes, does the White House lose leverage by opening the government with this kind of three-week deal? I mean, he's been, he's, it's been closed for a month. If he reopens it, doesn't, that, doesn't everyone just go back to their default positions? Look, there is a deadlock right now in Congress, and we need to find a solution. So let's see what uh, Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell come up with. They're in ongoing negotiations as mm -hmm. we speak. And I think that the president wants to see what the Senate has to offer. He has offered yeah. his good faith proposal, something that we know, uh, may, you know, mainstream America agrees with. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reality has become that the Democrats have no interest in talking about it. Uh, they have no interest, as Nancy Pelosi said from day one, that she, even if we were to reopen the government, she had no interest in negotiating with the president yeah. on border security, on the wall. So the president understands that uh, border security, including ensuring that we have these physical barriers and listening to our Border Patrol agents, that these are the resources we need to deal with this growing crisis on the border mm. where you have 60,000 illegal immigrants crossing the border a month. Uh, and many of in the cases where you see one in three women being sexually assaulted, these smugglers and human traffickers who take advantage of these children and women and these vulnerable families mm. um, at the border. This needs to stop and we need to make sure that we give the resources to our Border Patrol agents and our officers and ensure that there's physical barrier in yeah. place so they're able to manage the problem. Mercedes, how much is the White House looking for? I mean. A few months ago, it was $25 million. Now the asking price is down to $5 million. How did, uh, five billion, rather. How did it get, how, how did we, 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 we uh, move the, the price so low? Well, no, I mean, the $5 billion uh, would cover the over 200 miles of walls, uh, the wall or the physical barrier that they mm -hmm. could uh, create. This is based on the 10 top priorities of the Border Patrol agents. Uh, the $25 billion was an even more expansive number in addition to the physical barrier, and that was uh, uh, basically allocated through very, uh, several years. Uh, so I think the key is, is trying to make sure that we're able to get uh, uh, physical barrier funding. That is not the only thing that we would want. Obviously, mm -hmm. uh, we need to make sure, as a Democrats agree, that there's humanitarian assistance for those on the southern border. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure there's that counter narcotic technology. It detects weapons. It, uh, it detects uh, mm -hmm. drugs um, at these ports of entry. So we are in favor of more technology, more personnel, mm -hmm. as well as more immigration judges to deal with the vast numbers yeah. of, of backlog. I mean, we're talking about 800,000 thousand cases that still need to be heard right so we are they we are dealing with a, a serious resource deficiency at the border and it's something that uh the president's wanting to address now because it's something quite frankly raymond that hasn't been dealt with for decades yeah. and and this is the moment in time that we can resolve this because the crisis is growing and it is real are you surprised at this poll this marist npr poll where the president's job approval among latinos is at 50 percent why do you think we're seeing that? That seems counter to the media narrative we've been hearing for so many weeks here. Well, I mean, because the president has been fighting hard for all Americans. And I think when you look at the economic success stories for Latino families, uh, I think it's, it's so telling. I mean, the fact that unemployment numbers for Hispanics are at an all-time low. I mean, also, the president stands for those uh, traditional family values. I mean, we saw uh, the importance of his uh, fight for pro-life causes, as well as religious liberty, something that he feels very strongly about. And it's an administration that stands for mm -hmm. pro-family uh, legislation and pro-family beliefs. And I think that that's something that uh, Latino families can relate to, absolutely. I want to talk about uh, something we discussed uh, earlier with one of the Covington Catholic High School parents enmeshed in this viral story that really took the nation by storm this week. Is the administration inviting those students to the White House? And what is the president's take on this? 
Well, first of all, I think the president has coined the term uh, fake news pretty early on. Mm -hmm. And I do think that it's very unfortunate that you had so many liberal journalists that had to uh, retract their comments, that had to basically said that then had to apologize on Twitter because it was a complete knee-jerk reaction. They see a MAGA hat and their automatic reaction is white privilege, racism, bigotry. This is not what America is about. This is a land where we have the opportunity to see both sides of the story, where we're able to promote healthy debate and dialogue. Mm. And so I think that, you know, the, the liberal media has made it very clear where they stand and made a very emotional decision instead of uh, watching the whole entire video and then being objective, which is mm -hmm. what traditional journalism was all about back in the day, Raymond. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, well, we, we can look back and, and look at it fondly. <laughs> the glory days. Yeah, in the rearview mirror. <laughs> Uh, some are saying it was the it was the the kids MAGA hat and many of the boys were wearing it. That's what triggered this, and that that is a symbol of racism and hate. You'd say what? You know, it's a symbol of opportunity. It's a symbol of growth. It's a symbol about a great America, about an exceptional America where we're able to build on prosperity and remember that America is a wonderful country, that where we all have all these wonderful freedoms. I mean, you look at what ha what's happening in Venezuela right now, mm -hmm. where you've had a dictator, Nicolás Maduro, uh, basically destroy a nation, basically take away a, a, a fragile democracy. Mm -hmm. And what we have in America is this opportunity uh, to be able to have freedom of speech and freedom to worship and really the opportunity to have great economic growth like no other country. And other co we're the envy of other nations. And that's mm -hmm. something that I think uh, we, we really believe in and what the president believes in, which is no. that of making sure that every American has opportunity and an ability to make something great of their lives. Mercedes, before I let you go, you brought up Venezuela. The Trump administration announced that they were backing the opposition leader, Juan Guaido, uh, in Venezuela. On Wednesday, the president tweeted his support, writing, the citizens of Venezuela have suffered for too long at the hands of the illegitimate Maduro regime. Today, I've officially recognized the president of the Venezuelan National Assembly, Juan Guaido, uh, as the interim president of Venezuela. Now, other countries have also backed the U.S., but Russia and China have not. Is that a problem? And could Venezuela, Mercedes, become a proxy uh, war, if you will, between China, Russia, and the United States, similar to what we've seen in the Middle East? You know, that's a great question, Raymond. Here's the issue. What we're seeing in Venezuela has been the inability to have fair and free elections in this country. The Venezuelan people want to speak up. They have seen a destruction in a nation where now their population is greatly suffering, where there's not enough food, there's mm -hmm. not enough money, there's no opportunity, where literally the government has taken full control. And that is why you're finally seeing the people of Venezuela stand up against this regime. And, and the United States and this president has been so uh, strong in sending a message that we are supporting uh, the, the right now the interim president, Juan Guaido, who will, um, who really understands that the voice of the of what and what the needs are the Venezuelan people. And it's mm. very telling when you know who your friends are. If, and if Russia and China are going to be your best friends in this in this plan, you know, you're in the wrong in the wrong place here. So mm. we are pushing for freedom, democracy, the ability of the people to rule themselves, where we have uh, free and fair elections in Venezuela. And that is why the president is standing by uh, uh, Juan Guaido, who, as we know, uh, will hopefully uh, be able to take the reins and we can get Maduro out of there. Mm. Mercedes Schlapp, thank you for your time. And we'll be checking in with you in the coming days. Thank you so much, Raymond. Thank you. Father Gerald Murray is coming up. But first, the state legislature in New York has voted to legalize abortion throughout pregnancy all the way to birth. The procedure is now a fundamental right with the passage of the Reproductive Health Act. It cleared both houses by a wide margin. The new law removes protections from preborn babies beyond 24 weeks and allows licensed health practitioners, in other words, non-doctors, to perform abortions. And the 34th World Youth Day is now underway in Panama. Pope Francis arrived on Wednesday for the six-day event. 
the theme, I am the servant of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word from the Gospel of Luke. Migration is expected to be a hot topic during this six-day visit. About 150,000 people are registered to participate, with a half a million expected to attend the closing mass on Sunday. The numbers are sharply down from the last two World Youth Days, each of which generated three million participants each. Here with analysis is canon lawyer, priest of the Archdiocese of New York and one-third of the papal posse, Father Gerald Murray, who joins us from Manhattan. Father, thank you for being here. Uh, I, I need to start with this Covington High School incident uh, that happened here in D.C. The media, Father, were very quick to rush to judgment on these students. Two Catholic priests even joined the party, Father James Martin and Father Edward Beck. Uh, on January 19th, Father Martin tweeted, Catholic school students at the March for Life attempt to shame and disrespect a man at the Indigenous People's March. These actions are not Catholic, not Christian, and not acceptable. Would that these students fully understood the dignity of all human life, including this man's. Were you surprised, Father Murray, at um, Father Martin's rush to judgment when the story really had not yet been told? I'm disappointed by it. Surprised. I, I'm not quite sure uh, about that because I was unaware of the incident when I did see that tweet. But uh, it is an example of rash judgment. And, um, you know, Father Martin is the one always telling us don't be judgmental about people who promote the homosexual agenda in the church. But as soon as it comes to this partial video, he's, you know, mm. casting forth a very strong judgment. Mm. Well, he later backed off and he tweeted, finally, I don't agree with the no one should weigh in until all the facts are in argument because all the facts are never in. At some point, people are justified in offering reasonable opinions. My mistake was offering a condemnation. And for that, I again apologize. CNN contributor Father Edward Beck also weighed in on Twitter on January 21st, but he wasn't willing to let the kids off the hook, even though the facts were then coming in, and we saw some of the video we saw earlier in the show. He wrote, my feelings about the Covington boys are unchanged. Since the first reporting and viewing many different videos, the boys acted inappropriately and chaperones should have intervened. The boys should not have been permitted to wear MAGA hats if they were representing the school. Now, uh, Father Jerry, the Bishop of Lexington, John Stowe, wrote an op-ed airing similar feelings. Uh, is it acceptable, or unacceptable, rather, for Catholic kids to wear a, a, a MAGA hat like this? Of course it's acceptable. This is a free country. Um, if people want to express their uh, political opinions uh, when they're out at a public rally, uh, that's the way it is. That's American freedom. Uh, I noticed Father Beck, instead of you know, addressing the injustice that these uh, boys had suffered at the hands of the viral lynch mob on the on the mm. internet, he focuses on his disdain for the MAGA hats, for the basically for the Trump uh, supporters. Well, please, Father, that's not the issue here. These young men were uh, unfairly criticized for something that they didn't do. Mm. Uh, that's you know, sympathy should go to them. Yeah, Bishop Stowe wrote, and I'm going to put this on the screen and get your reaction. He wrote, wearing apparel, sporting the slogan of a president who denigrates the lives of immigrants, refugees, and people from countries that he describes with indecent words and haphazardly endangers with life-threatening policies. Is there an effort? Do you sense an effort here, Father? I've seen it in a lot of the coverage uh, to try to expand the meaning of pro-life and the meaning of this pro-life march to almost uh, commandeer it or hijack it. Well, it's very curious, um, you know, that the bishop would take all that energy directed towards hat wearing. Uh, the boys were in Washington to protest the killing of innocent un unborn human beings, our brothers and sisters who were killed because of the Supreme Court decision, Roe v. Wade. We have a president who has appointed two justices of the Supreme Court who have a record of being constitutional constructionists of the strict sort, and we expect that abortion will not continue to be legal because of Roe v. Wade when it's overturned. Mm. That's what we should be rejoicing in. You know, the, the mm. abortion regime is horrible in this country. That, that's what we have to focus on. Mm. Father, the anti-Catholic tone of this controversy was also striking particularly from the video evidence leading up to this confrontation with Nathan Phillips, who would later be involved at a protest at the Basilica of the National Shrine. He had tried to interrupt a mass. Did you sense an anti-Catholic animus in the way this entire affair was depicted? 
I certainly did. And um, as we know, the left-wing media that supports abortion and same-sex marriage, uh, they do not like the Catholic Church. So these students became the surrogates for their mm. attack on the doctrine of the faith. And that really is, uh, it's a form of bigotry. It's a form of religious intolerance. And it's a manipulation uh, and using, you know, high school kids in order to try and make a point. Mm. I thought in this country we were decent enough to say free speech is something we protect. And we don't go after high school students because they express their opinion freely in public. Mm. Father George Rutler, your colleague in New York, um, and certainly a familiar face to our audience, wrote a column this week calling attention to the way that this was handled by the Covington Diocese, where these boys live. Um, he took a swipe at virtue signaling, and then he wrote, Our Lord condemned virtue signaling in his parable of the Pharisees and the tax collector in the temple. I thank you, Lord, that I am not like this sinner. There are Pharisees in every corridor of society, but they find a most comfortable berth in the church. So it was that the very diocese of the Covington students, without interviewing them or asking for evidence outside the media, promptly rushed to punish them. Your thoughts, Father? Yes, I would have preferred if the bishop had actually met with the students and requested a fuller account before going public with a condemnation. Uh, it's not good for bishops to be condemning uh, their parishioners, their diocesan members, simply on the basis of a partial video clip of an incident at which they weren't present. Yeah. Uh, I think the bishop must regret it. I know that he said he's going to look at it, mm -hmm. and I certainly hope that he will issue an apology because those students were put in a very difficult position. They're Catholic kids in a Catholic diocese, and suddenly the bishop is calling them things that they don't deserve to be called. Yeah, also, they, they, you know, they condemned the boy based on a smirk. You know, the kid didn't yell, he didn't hit, he didn't uh, throw a temper tantrum, he didn't push anybody. I mean, I, I, I have a 15-year-old son, uh, this is this is exemplary behavior for a 15 year old kid. I mean, come on. Uh, yes, yeah, smirking is not uh, is not a crime. Yeah, there, somebody sent around a, a, a little quote from uh, 1984 where they said, you know, it's the it's the face death. You know, just an expression can get you killed. Face crime, face crime. Um, let's move on, Father, to the Vatican and this ongoing sex abuse crisis. The AP reported on Sunday. The Vatican knew about abuse allegations against Pope Francis's protege, former Bishop Gustavo Zanchetta, perhaps as far back as 2015. Now, despite that alleged knowledge, Pope Francis appointed Zanchetta as the administrator of the Patrimony of the Holy See in 2017. Now, following the AP reports, the Vatican Press Office continues to deny that they or the Pope knew about these salacious allegations and only found out about them recently. Still, you have... Uh, Zanchetta's former vicar general maintaining that the Vatican received these complaints both in 2015 and 2017, and that these complaints concerned obscene behavior and photographs of behavior with seminarians. Uh, is this at all credible? And where does this leave us? We have two conflicting, diametrically opposed explanations of what happened here. Uh, the vicar, former vicar general from the Iran diocese uh, claims, and I have no reason to disbelieve him, that he contacted the Vatican in 2015 and that he contacted the Nuncio in 2017 to report on the immoral behavior of the bishop of the diocese of Iran. And in 2017, that bishop quit, uh, vacated the premises basically overnight, and then reemerged in Rome about three or four months later. Uh, where he was given a role uh, in the uh, administration of the Holy See's real estate holdings. Hmm. Uh, the Vatican account is that they knew nothing about sexual abuse allegations until the fall of 2018, and uh, now they're going to look into them. Uh, these both accounts cannot be true. Yeah. Uh, this is an example of why we need a full explanation from the Holy See what they knew because right now, uh, the Holy See is in essence saying that the vicar general, uh, former vicar general of that diocese is not telling the truth. Right. Because, of course, he said he met with the nuncio and he said he made a report to the Vatican, mm. including photos 
uh, of an immoral sword of the bishop. Mm. Somebody's not telling the truth here. Yeah. We need to know what's going on. Father, this sounds remarkably similar to the denial surrounding the McCarrick situation here in the U.S. I mean, Zanchetta is clearly under investigation now. Currently, the Vatican has said that. He's on temporary leave. Do you think there's going to be a quick resolution to this before the Vatican Abuse Summit just a few weeks from now? Good question, Raymond. I don't know because, uh, you know, there's a lot here. Uh, certainly, if they got these accusations in 2018, uh, they should tell us what the nature of them were. And it's also interesting, the spokesman said they got them sometime in the fall of 2018, but they didn't remove uh, Bishop Zanchetta from his role mm. until after all of this hit the Argentine press on right. Christmas Day. So what happened in those time between when they got the reports and when it became public? Was Zanchetta informed of these uh, accusations? No. Did he deny them? We don't know anything about that. We need to know these things. Yeah. Father, I've got to get to this. As I mentioned earlier, the State Senate of New York passed a pro-abortion law this week that would legalize abortion for practically any reason right up until birth. Uh, here's a rather shocking moment when the bill was passed. You see people here, there, there's, a, there's a standing ovation and they're high-fiving and cheering. Uh, Late-term abortions, once illegal, are now permitted, though they claim it's restricted, but there's such a broad health exemption uh, that after 24 weeks, you can basically abort the child for, for age, economic or social or emotional distress. Uh, your thoughts on this and uh, where this leaves not only New York but the country? Um, this is a total disaster for the state of New York where I live. It's an example of the fanaticism and extremism of the pro-abortion side in this country. Uh, this law allows the killing of children who have viability, as, as it's called, and, you know, uh, viability meaning the ability to live outside the womb. Right. Uh, the so-called, they need to do it for health reasons. If the woman says, this is going to make me feel bad and affect my mental peace, mm. then a pro-abortion doctor or even non-doctor now right. can do this abortion. Uh, Governor Cuomo uh, is someone who has tried to associate himself in the past with Pope Francis and his message of concern for the needy, the marginalized, those mm -hmm. who are put down in society. And now what is he doing? He is giving free reign to the killing of the most needy people in the world, that is the, the child in the womb, who needs to be protected both by his mother and by the civil society. Mm. And now that's all gone. Very, very bad decision by the Senate and by mm. the governor. Monsignor Charles Pope of the Archdiocese of Washington, uh, writing in the National Catholic Register this week, is calling for Catholic supporters of abortion, like Governor Andrew Cuomo, to face penalties. Is it time for canonical penalties to be leveled against these very public Catholic figures who advocate the, uh, the, the, the slaughter of these unborn children? There do need to be penalties. I mean, it should start, number one, by a warning to issue to him that says either he withdraws his support for this legislation mm -hmm. or he will suffer canonical penalties. We also need a condemnation of this sort of attitude, this ideology that the governor and these state senators are promoting. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, th this is horrendous. We're living in a country now where the sign of virtue uh, for so many of our citizens, meaning the people that elected uh, Cuomo and the others, mm -hmm. the sign of virtue for them is, are you in favor of killing children, you know, 10 minutes before they can be born? Uh, this is horrendous. This is dehumanizing. It is really a cruel, unjust, and it needs to be stopped. And mm -hmm. one way you stop it is by convincing these people that they cannot pretend to be Catholics and support this kind of legislation. Mm -hmm. Get them to think about what they're doing. Before I let you go very quickly, World Youth Day is just getting underway this week in Panama. The Pope is there. Um, the, the attendance apparently is down. Uh, there are 150,000 people registered, a steep decline in the numbers from years past. To what do you attribute that? You've been covering this. Uh, what do you expect to hear from the Pope? Well, you know, the Pope is in a country, a uh, small country in Central America, and it is in the middle of the school year here in America, in North America and, and Europe, so mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be less people coming from those regions. Um, I'm expecting the Pope to give a good message of hope uh, for the future and inspire young people to love Christ and to serve the church, mm. to serve the poor. Uh, I also hope he's going to address the scourge of sexual abuse by the clergy because that is a topic that's on everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. Certainly the meeting's coming up in February in Rome and people are going to want to know how are we dealing with this because that's basically a justice issue. Is yeah. justice going to be rendered to the victims mm. uh, of sexual abuse by the church's own ministers and, and yeah. bishops? So this is something I hope he will bring up. Yeah. 
Father Jerry Murray, I thank you for being here. You can read Father Jerry's commentary as well as Robert Royal's over at thecatholicthing.org, and you can subscribe on their website. It's free. You'll get the latest for the, from the Catholic Thing every morning in your inbox. Thank you so much again, Father. Thank you, Raymond. And finally, we lost another Hollywood legend this week, Kay Ballard, the singer and comedian whose career began in vaudeville and continued through the golden age of television and on to Broadway, passed away at her home in Rancho Mirage this week. She was 93. She's best known for her role on TV in The Mothers-in-Law with Eve Arden, but she was an entertainer who could do it all, from Broadway musicals to the silver screen. I sat down with her a few years ago to talk about her life, her seven-decade career in showbiz. Here's an encore of my exclusive interview with Kay Ballard. Looking back. Looking back. What do you think of this career? If I had to do it again, mm -hmm. would I? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Really? Isn't that interesting? Yeah, I'll say. I think the only time I've ever been happy is on stage. Really happy. Mm -hmm. Fulfilled is, is on stage. Mm. But yet, what you have to go through to get to that point, I don't know. You say at one point in the book, uh, I was an Italian Catholic woman born into a world where she never seemed to fit. What it's do you true. Mean by that? Oh, I mean, I mean just that. <laughs> when I was growing up, it was very difficult to be a woman. Born Catherine Gloria Bellata from mm -hmm. Cleveland, Ohio. Tell me about yes. your, your parents. Were they supportive of this choice to go into showbiz? No, not really. Mm -hmm. I told them. I told you I was an enigma. I said, I'm going out at nine. I'm, no, I'm going out. I'll be home at nine. They looked at me and said, where did this little freak come from? <laughs> <laughs> but my father trusted me so implicitly. He, he knew I'd never do anything to embarrass him. Mm -hmm. My mother loved me very much, but she didn't know how to show it. Mm. And um, it was, I, I, I've worked since I was 12. I got a, a work permit because I had these dark circles under my eyes and they thought I was 14. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've always worked and I paid them rent. It was very strange. I was an unusual child, yeah, and, <laughs> to and, say the least. And, and you, I was stunned to learn that you lost your hearing in, what is it, your right ear? In my right ear when I was 11. I was climbing up a tree at my cousin's house in Elyria, Ohio and a rooster was chasing me <laughs> and I fell off and I fell on a cement pavement and when they took me to the doctor he didn't drain my ear so it deadened the nerve. Oh, God. So I've gone through life with one ear and singing. And as a singer, I mean that's an amazing Mostly on thing. key. <laughs> <laughs> well that's nice when it happens, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it wonderful? I've always known what I wanted to do. When did you know you wanted to be a performer? When I was five. I would take my father's straw hat and I'd imitate Maurice Chevalier and say, Mimi, you funny little good for nothing, Mimi. And they'd hit me and say, take that off and learn how to do the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> From a very Italian family, first generation. That part of you and that light in your eyes, there's something profoundly to my eye Catholic about that. Very Catholic. <laughs> how, do you, how, do you, how do you see that? How is your faith? I think Catholic has kept me in line. I never tried marijuana. I never did things <laughs> that, that, you know, I, I knew right from wrong. Mm -hmm. I loved my religion. I got my first communion when I was older, like 10, and I was the tallest kid in the thing. <laughs> I felt embarrassed. I mean, I was so tall, and everybody was little midgets around there. I thought, wow. It took me a long time. You had the great good fortune to be, not only to be born in a time where these great people were there performing. On the peripheral of the... But you had, you had access to them, and then you worked with them. Yes, and I got to know idols like Betty Davis and Barbara Stanwyck and people that I worshipped. Hmm. Worshipped. Jimmy Durante, Jack Benny. I, I am so lucky. And then later you became friends with Charles Schultz. Uh, that was, created the great peanuts. He was uh, the most brilliant. How did you know him? Now there's a man that was insecure. When I met him in 1958, he said, Kay, I just bought, I just bought this house. It's 125000 I don't, I hope I can pay for it. 
<laughs> then the following year he made millions mm -hmm. and went on from there. Wow. And his present wife now, Jeannie Schultz, has been very kind to me. She gave me permission to use the album cover he did for me. Right. And uh, he was wonderful. And you did a, and you did a, a group of songs based on the strip. Arthur Siegel wrote a wonderful group of songs. But then there was a man named John Hammond at Columbia who said, oh, no, no, I want sound effects. And he was wrong. Mm. But that's another one of those luckies back in town breaks. Mm. And but later they would do You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, which is a musical. Arthur Whitelaw will tell you he got the idea for that from our album. Oh, God. Yes. Well, that's what I mean. You were, you presaged so many of these things. You were almost before your time, Kay. I was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about the Fred Ebb classic, uh, maybe this time a song that yes. everyone equates with Liza Minnelli. Well, first that was of all, I adored Fred Ebb. Mm -hmm. I believed in him before anybody believed in him. And I, he wrote Coloring Book for me. Oh. And I sang it at the, the Bonsoir, and I was doing the Perry Como show at the time. Mm -hmm. I said, please let me sing this song. It's very current. He said, no, you're not the singer. Sandy Stewart is the singer. You cannot sing it. I said, well, then let her sing it because it's very current. Mm -hmm. And it was a great success for her, and I was thrilled about that because I love Sandy Stewart. Mm -hmm. But then Barbara Streisand came along and made it hers. <laughs> but she, she just had an incredible voice, incredible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what about maybe this time? When I you. got Coloring Book on the air, mm -hmm. he came to me with tears in his eyes. Fred Ebb did. Yes. And said, oh, I don't know what to do for you. I said, you can write me a song called Maybe Next Time I'll Be Lucky. <laughs> and he came the next day with the song and said, this is yours forever. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wiped the tears away, gave it to Liza Minnelli, and the rest is history. Yes, when I went to see her at the plaza, and she said, a song written just for me, and did maybe this time. I, that was the end of my friendship with Fred, and we didn't speak together for 30 years. Oh my God. But then we did make up toward the end of his life, because I basically knew the talent he had, and I really loved him. Mm -hmm. You did that wonderful original made-for-TV musical, Cinderella, which yes. Rodgers and Hammerstein wrote. When we did the reading of Cinderella, Richard Rodgers played the score, and Oscar Hammerstein recited the lyrics. And when he sang, Do I love you because you're beautiful? Or are you beautiful because I love you? The tears just ran down my face, and I thought, I'm in the presence of such greatness. Mm -hmm. It's a little different than too late baby now. <laughs> <laughs> I, w I should say so. Yes. And, and, and when you look back, they just recently re-released that on DVD a few years back, mm -hmm. a cleaned up version, beautiful version of that, uh, that performance. You, were, you playing one of Cinderella's stepsister. Yes. What did you think watching it all those years later? I thought, gee, I wasn't so ugly. <laughs> And I wasn't fat. I spent my whole life thinking I was overweight. <laughs> and you see that? Yeah, well, see how you mustn't waste time. <laughs> but what do you think now when you look back on that particular experience? I mean, that was those wonderful. great giants. I mean, yes. w we don't have anything like that and probably won't see anything like them again. You know something, Raymond? I, I knew they were giants. Isn't that mm -hmm. wonderful? Mm -hmm. that I appreciated them at that moment. Howard Lindsay and Dorothy Stickney and Ilka Chase mm -hmm. and Julie Andrews and my darling Alice Ghostly and mm -hmm. Edie Adams. I knew I was in the presence of real something special. Mm -hmm. And of course, working right then and there with Rogers and Hammerstein. Amazing. Can't do better than that. No, just amazing. Yeah. Let's talk a moment about The Golden Apple. This was a show that is still a wonderful show. It holds it is. up. It and, holds up today. Really. And I don't know why there aren't more revivals of it. Because it's difficult. It was the first opera. Mm -hmm. You know, there was no dialogue in that show. Mm -hmm. It was sung from beginning to end. Mm. And 
John Latouche, when I heard Lazy Afternoon at his house, mm -hmm. at just a money audition, I said, I have to sing that song. Because if you hold my hand and sit real still, you can hear the grass as it grows. I mean, mm -hmm. the lyrics. Beautiful. And then... Later stolen again by... Yes. <laughs> Barbara <laughs> Streisand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> She's still singing Lazy Afternoon, touring the country. You know really? that. Really? Uh-huh. So Tell her to shut up. <laughs> What would you still like to do? I, l let, me, let me back up a second. I saw you recently in Nonsense, mm -hmm. playing the Mother Superior. Which was fun. <laughs> yeah, you were glorious in it, yeah. and a lot of fun. Stopped the show every night. Several years ago, I saw you at Paper Mill Playhouse in New Jersey in Follies. That was an exciting experience. I'll say. Tell Working. me about that. And to only do one number, it was terrifying, because I dressed with Lillian Montevecchi, who is one of my closest friends. And we both said, are we crazy? We have one number each. And if we miss one lyric, there's no getting out of it. <laughs> so each night it was like panic time because you only had that one shot. And she'd come off and she'd say, okay, I missed a lyric. I said, don't worry, they don't understand you any. <laughs> 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 but it was, it was a glorious time and it was a show that the hair on my arms stood up every night when they played the overture. Mm -hmm. And when the first one that walked down that stairs, when he said, you know, saying, Beautiful girl. That's Here right, was Lilia Montevecchi, who was a Follies girl for 25 years in Paris. Mm. The hair on my arms stood up, and then Donna McKechnie was the next one, mm -hmm. who was glorious. Mm -hmm. And the next one was Laura Kenyon, who was glorious. Everybody in it, D. Hody, everybody in it was yeah. fabulous. Phyllis mm. Newman, everyone. And Ann Miller. And then the last mm. one was Ann Miller in all the beads she wore <laughs> in <laughs> and the MGM movies. I thought, my God, this is about as perfect as you can get. Yeah, yeah it was quite a production. It was. And you were marvelous in it. What else would you like to do? I would, before I die, if... God willing, I want to do a movie that I can say, that's the best I can do. And I, want, I would love to do a Broadway show again, but mm -hmm. I don't know if my left knee will allow that. Mm -hmm. We are in, we should say, Desi Arnaz's yes. old house here in Palm Springs. Mm -hmm. um, you not only live in his former house, you did a series for him, The Mothers-in-Law with Eve Arnaz. Yes, which was a very happy experience. What was it like working with Desi Arnaz? A he was real a genius. But, you know, Vivian Vance told me that ahead of time when I mm -hmm. met her in New York when I was going out to do the pilot. She said, Kay, you're going to work with the most tasteful man in show business. I said, really? She says, yes, Desi Arnaz. Mm -hmm. He edited every single Lucy script, and he edited every single Mothers-in-Law script, mm -hmm. and every single Untouchables. Wow. wow. He was running Desi Lou at that point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when I got this house, it was Christmas time, he gave everyone a present. He says, you'll get no present. I said, okay. He said, well, I'm going to let you use my house in Palm Springs. I said, okay. I came here. There was a Santa Claus floating in the pool. Mm -hmm. On the table was a money tree. Huh. And in the refrigerator was champagne and caviar. Now, you've got to love a man like that. <laughs> And you ended up buying the house. Bought the house. That is all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. You can like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. And now you can go pre-order, and you should, book three in The Adventures of Will Wilder. It's out next month. Will Wilder, The Amulet of Power. It hits bookstores on February 19th. Uh, I'll have some offers for you in the coming days, but you can pre-order it now at the usual outlets, including the EWTN catalog. Be sure to join us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.